This is Julian, and I'm here with Jay Samet, author of Disrupt You. I actually made a video about this book. I'll put a link to it here below, which I highly recommend checking out. And what I thought we could do here is crack into some of the examples you use in the book. I mean, all throughout the book, there are tons of examples of either companies or industries that have been disrupted. And for me, I mean, that's really what kind of, you know, woke me up to it. I mean, in terms of how I was running business, there were many things that I knew had to be disrupted, but were just so addicted to hanging on to the status quo. It's like, I'll just do it tomorrow and tomorrow. And reading well, it's, the- it, it's comforting. I mean, I know. When, you, when you realize uh, I'm a public company CEO, when you look mm-hmm. at what got people up to the C-suite, they're like, that got me here. I'm going to continue doing that. That's why I'm successful. And they get so myopic that they don't realize that our world has fundamentally changed. Yeah. Um, you know, the big, bold examples is everybody's career is going to get disrupted, whether by choice or circumstance. You don't get to choose anymore. You're Your job security isn't there. It's the illusion of of security that keeps you at your job. But we just had in the news uh, Marriott and Starwood merge. Two biggest hotel chains in the world merge, become the giant hotel chain, and yet they're number two to a company that puts more people in beds at night and doesn't own a single hotel, Airbnb, completely disrupted. Your taxi cab companies, Uber doesn't own a single car. They have 1 million employees that report to a piece of software. Let that sink in for a second. They report to Skynet, okay? They don't have a boss. They didn't go through HR. There's no middle management. If logistics of picking up somebody and delivering them can be done without any management layer, what do you think is going to happen to most office jobs at most companies? 40% of white-collar jobs will be automated out over the next five years. 3D printing is eliminating 300 million manufacturing jobs. Things going digital means less retail, less less trucking, less distribution centers. There's two billion millennials. There will not be jobs. So unless you figure out how to create your own opportunity, it looks like a dire time when in fact it's probably the best time to be alive because change means new opportunity. Yeah. So you can embrace it or see it as an obstacle. But if you keep on doing what you were taught, get the good grade, go out, you'll get a job and you'll get that gold watch. That era is gone. The Fortune 500 companies, it's the 60th anniversary of the Fortune 500. Those were the big companies. They'll be there forever. You get the gold watch. You get the pension. You retire. Only 57 of them are still around. Okay? You have big, giant, 100-year-old companies. You know, Um, I was president of the largest music company in the world, EMI. They invented the phonograph. Okay? They signed in Rico Caruso, the Beatles, Pink Floyd, Beach Boys, Sinatra. Okay? They're gone. Okay? Why? Because they thought that they were in the business of selling round things that they manufactured, went on a truck, and went to a store. And when the model changed to, I can just buy one song or I could steal the one song, yeah. they didn't change fast enough. Yeah, and this requires being extremely creative as well. And uh, one thing you talk about in the book, and I think you advise your students to do this, was to just constantly think of like problems to solve, just on a daily basis. Like, what are some problems I can solve to kind of see all those new angles there? Yeah, so the simple challenge that I give everybody, I will tell you in the next two minutes how you can have as much deal flow as Kleiner, Perkins, you know, Sequoia, the biggest venture capital firms, the companies that make billions of dollars and have all these MBAs and have meeting rooms and everything. I'll give you the gold in two seconds, and it's this. All that an entrepreneur does is solve problems. The more people you solve problems for, the more money you make. People didn't buy a car from Henry Ford because they go, oh, my God, I love the combustion engine. They went and said, wow, I can now deliver stuff faster. I can get between cities faster. This is better than a horse. You've solved a problem for me. Thank you, Mr. Entrepreneur. I'll buy it. Okay. You didn't buy air conditioning because you love the circuitry. You said, God, it is hot. Okay. So look at problems that you can solve and say, well, how do you find those? If you have a perfect life, you'll make a horrible business person. You'll make a horrible entrepreneur. If you have a lot of problems, congratulations, you're halfway there. Every obstacle is an opportunity in disguise. So write down three problems in your life today. Simple one. I had traffic this morning. Okay. It can be as simple as that. But as you go through a month, writing down three a day makes you start looking at your world more closely, more carefully. So I'll give you one that somebody came up to me that, it's doing phenomenal that, that I'm working with. Did I take my medicine right before Julian called? I don't remember. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Well, 
efficacy of drugs is the biggest problem in healthcare because if you actually took all your prescriptions properly, more people would be, be healthy. So he took the little watch that you get in the Happy Meal, costs six cents, puts it on the lid of a pill bottle, and every time you close the bottle, it sets the countdown clock over. So I pick up the bottle and goes, it's been four minutes. Oh, yeah, I took the pill right before Julian called. Or, oh, it's been 12 hours. No, I didn't. That one, he didn't invent the watch. He didn't invent the pill bottle. But putting it together, he has the patents on that. So the first wave is he's selling it and he's making millions of dollars. That's nice. Doesn't change the world. But he now has bills going through Congress because now that we have nationalized health care, the country can save tens of billions of dollars a year if people only followed their prescriptions and got healthy faster. So if it now becomes mandatory that every pill bottle has to have his invention, he's making money off of every prescription in the United States. It's that simple. And that came out of the process of looking at problems. And he now has the super deluxe one for the guilt of, of young people whose parents live in other towns is that app can now be Wi-Fi, that cap, so that I can look on my phone and say, grandma didn't take her medicine. Let me call grandma. Now, when, once grandma figures out how you're doing it, she'll stop taking her medicine so you call every day. But the point is, you don't have to invent some great technology. You don't have to be an engineer. You just have to solve problems. I you know, did the first internet auction and then Pierre created that into eBay. I worked with Reed Hop and that became LinkedIn. Uh, created some of the hit video games, video chat that we're seeing now, uh, the, the number one video chat in, in mobile. That was, that was me. But in 30 years, I've yet to write a single line of code. I'm not an engineer. Steve Jobs is not an engineer, okay? So the only things you need to be successful are drive and persistence. Everything else can be hired. So what is stopping you from disrupting the world and being successful? Yeah. You are. So you really have to start with that internal dialogue. Why do I not believe that I can do it? If you think you can or you think you can, you're right. So stop thinking that you can't. When I start, if I knew everything I knew today about business, when I started my first business 30-some years ago, I would have known enough not to do it. I would have known this is impossible. The odds are against you. Oh, my God. But I was young, naive, arrogant, and said, I have a really good idea. I don't know anything about business, but I have a good idea. And that company went on to be super successful. So you don't need all the answers. And you even don't need a good idea. And that's the part that, that, that surprises people. You need to see a problem, have your idea, start talking to people that have the problem. And through that process of iteration, you will pivot. And it will change. And it'll change to something. And the reason why you'll come up with a good idea is because nobody went down that path as far as you did. So one of my favorite examples in the book is when broadband came out. These three guys sat down and said, wait a second. Every dating site, which I know you know about on the Internet, has a still picture. But now with broadband, you could do a video. So we're going to make a dating site and you're going to see the video, hear their accent, get a sense of their person. We're going to make millions. This is the greatest idea. And it was called Tune In Hookup. And the three guys built it. They put it up there. Bam, a bunch of people came to it. And nobody wanted to date these losers. There was a flaw in their business. But they looked at the data. And in this world, no matter what your business is, you're getting tons of data. And the data was nobody wanted to date that guy in the video but they sure wanted to show all their girlfriends how bad the prospects were. So people were sending out links to go look at these videos. So I said, wow, people want to watch the videos. They don't want to date the people. We'll change the name of it to YouTube. And their first year in business, they sold for over a billion dollars without making a penny. It's that easy. I'd say the other big complaint, too, from, say, entrepreneurs who are starting out with an idea is uh, finances. And you talk about so, this, too, in the book. And it's also being creative where you don't even need the money. It just... You know, you call it OPM, like other people's money. So the I couldn't raise the money for my idea is the, the grown-ups version of the dog ate my homework, okay? Venture capitalists this year gave away $40 billion. You're actually keeping them in business. Unless somebody walks in with an idea, they, they go home. Their job is to give away money. They want to walk in. They want a simple job. They would like in the beginning of the year – to give away all their money and not have to do all these stupid meetings. So learn what they're looking for. Learn how to talk their language, and it's easy to do that. But then there's other people, and they want some equity for it. But there's other people, what I talk about, the OPM, 
they will give you money. They don't want the money back and they don't want a piece of your company. And people look at me like, like a dog looks at you like, mm. you have an idea that not just helps you, but might help another business. And I'll give you, give you, you know, one of my classic personal stories. I was tasked by Sony to compete with iTunes. Sony's going to set up their own thing. How do you come in second to that market? Steve Jobs was spending $100 million a year just on marketing of iTunes, and you're going to come in second. So I said, I can't do this alone. I also don't have the $100 million to spend. Who has problems? So I looked in the news, and there were two companies in the news having problems. One was United Airlines was in bankruptcy, but they were about to come out of bankruptcy. And the other was McDonald's. Uh, uh, the movie Super Size Me came out that if you ate McDonald's for 30 days, you would die. And so their stock was down, their sales were down. And I said, okay, if I can solve the problems for these two companies, they'll spend tons of money that they don't want back because I'm saving their billion dollar businesses. What does this have to do with a music download store? Connect the dots. So to United, I said, what if we said you could use your frequent flyer miles to buy music and we'll announce it by having Sheryl Crow do a concert in the sky from Chicago to LA Fill the plane with press and everybody will know you're out of bankruptcy and here's this great exciting airline and have that video that we shoot of it play on every flight for a month. So – and you guys have to pay for Cheryl. So that cost me nothing. They painted the plane with our logo. We got evening news coverage on all four networks. We had 600 press stories. Amazing. At the same day and date, I had worked out with McDonald's and said, what if I could make your hip and cool? Again, how would you do that? Buy a Big Mac, get a free track. So put a little code on every Big Mac. You'll put signage in all the windows, tray liners. You'll make a TV commercial, and they have greatest TV commercial people. Uh, uh, there was a kid in a boy band that was breaking out and wanted to be independent and get some exposure for his first solo album. He's very nervous. So Justin Timberlake basically did the commercial for nothing. Um, and so you wake up one day, every McDonald's in nine countries – is completely up and down, driving people to my download store. 20 million customers. My partner spent 60, 80 million dollars to drive customers to me. My cost of marketing, nothing. And if you read the book, I actually ended up making a profit off of one of those partners because of their own paranoia. Um, so I actually, day one of opening my store was millions of dollars in profits. Hmm. And I've done this again and again and again, as have others, because let's deconstruct it for your business. You've got an idea that's for senior citizens or for moms or for this. Who else wants to reach those people? Who else would benefit from more customers? Who has more marketing dollars than creative ideas? So you bring your idea to them. It could be a cause. It could be a charity. It could be almost anything. The second excuse after money is I don't have any contacts. How, how am I going to get to these people, right? I didn't grow up knowing the president and the pope and, and all, the, all the partners that I've worked with. But I also didn't grow up when LinkedIn was there. You can find mentors, anybody you can search. And don't, don't go, hey, will you give me some money, right? Ask them a – I get those. Yeah. Ask them a question. Ask for advice. People want to be validated. People want to help. People want to take what they've learned and share with the next generation. And you can find people with amazing connections because we're all just about three degrees apart. There's about 6,000 people that control all the money in the world. Okay, It's not that hard to start putting deals together. And once you do, it's amazing the response. You can also go to every conference. So here's the amazing thing. How many people say, oh, my God. I guess I really should go to this conference. I'll spend $600, spend $1,000. on. I think I might meet somebody at the, at the bar waiting for a drink. You know, This is going to be good for my career. I've never paid a dime to go to any of the conferences around the world. You know what I do? I say, you need speakers for your conference, don't you? I'm the foremost authority on X. Next thing you know, there's a whole room of 1,000 people that all leave knowing you. And at the end of it, they're coming to you with their business cards because they want to do business with you. I did a conference a few years ago when I had the, the number one app with teenagers in the world, okay? And great for advertisers who want to reach teenagers, but that doesn't mean you can reach every CMO and every brand. And I'm there speaking, and I get off the stage, and there's the usual people that, that are lined up to meet you and talk. And one guy is the CMO for Target, and he said to me, 
His daughter, who uses the app, said, you have to meet this guy because this company is what it's all about. That is a guy with millions and millions, if not a billion dollars to spend in advertising, coming to me saying, I want to give you a truckload of money, right? And that conference is thousands of dollars to attend. I, I didn't spend a dime to attend. There was a young kid who actually won a Clio for doing this, uh, an advertising uh, version of the Oscars. He was at the bottom rungs of a giant ad agency. I mean, the five companies that control all the world's advertising, I mean, it'll take you 30 years to get noticed because you're doing stupid jobs like you're working your way up, that, that old system of I'm going to get the gold watch. And he didn't have the patience. He hated where he worked. He, he went into advertising because he wanted to work with creative geniuses. He had, he had a creative mind. So it occurred to him one day, that people Google themselves. So he looked up the three biggest names of the biggest creative directors of the biggest agencies and saw no one was buying their name as, a, as an ad on, you know, AdWords. Hmm. And so for, you know, less than a penny, you know, he could do that. So he spent, I think, like five dollars, bought those keywords. And whenever those big famous people Googled themselves, they basically said, hey, I want to work for you. Click here and went to a website of his portfolio. All of the people thought it was so creative. All of them called him in for interviews. And he got to pick which of the top three guys in the world he wanted to report to. It's about being creative. And it's about understanding that the world is malleable. You can change it. The only people that have ever changed the world are those people that stood up and said, I'm going to do it. Right? If you follow somebody else's path, you're not going to get there. And if you listen to all those people that told you that you can't, you're going to be just like them. Why give up on your dreams listening to people that gave up on theirs? Yeah. You know, then you get to go work for somebody else to make their dreams come true. And that's fine. But if that's not what's sitting with you, because here's what's going to happen. A lot of people have this fear of failure. And they don't understand the difference between failing and failure. Failure is I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done. I'm checking out, you know, I don't care, you know, I'll spend the next 30 years going, would you like a prize with that? Okay, that's failure. Failing is trying something and finding out it doesn't work. Everything that I've done in my life hasn't been, ooh, here's another million, here's another million. You try things and you find out that they don't work. Our idea of creative genius, the symbol for it, that light bulb, is because Thomas Edison said he tried 10,000 things that didn't work till he found one that did, you know? Bill Gates' first company went bankrupt. Walt Disney's went bankrupt. I mean, you go through Henry Ford went bankrupt. Heinz, Heinz Ketchup, they went back. You know, a lot of people, you know, learn what doesn't work. And from that process, you get smarter and wiser of what will. But if you never get in the game, here's what's going to happen. Go to your grandparents. Go to any old person you can meet. And they will tell you that their biggest regrets in life aren't the things that they failed at. It's the times they failed to try. The what if, what if I had, you know, what if I tried my hand at being a rock musician for a year? What if I tried my hand doing this or that? You know, it is those things that make you different and unique that will introduce you to new opportunities. So it's the most amazing time to be alive. Capital is easy to get. You, there's no gatekeepers to capital. Crowdfunding. You just put up an idea and the world goes, yeah, that solves a problem for me. I want that. I mean, there was, there was one that uh, was just up on crowdfunding that I so want. It is the definition of who I am, that I'm in dialogue with them, that I want to be the person to introduce this. I want to wear this product. It's a, it's a wearable technology. And my TED Talk that's coming up in, 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 a, in, a, in a couple months. I'm like, I have to have this. I need this toy. What size check do I have to write to be your partner, your investor, whatever? That's the world we live in. Yeah. I mean, I'm like a little kid. I wish I had 12 lives right now. I could give you a list of billion dollar ideas right now that if I if I had the time would be the things that I would focus on because there's so many new things. You can't pick all of them. And by the way, I don't always pick the right one. I, I told the story the other day. I hadn't told the story for a million years. So I started on the Internet in 78. OK, I put the first video on a computer. I mean, this is back when people were manufacturing devices but didn't know what they were doing with them. They thought you'd buy a computer to balance your checkbook, you know. How bizarre is that? A, nobody bounces a checkbook, and today nobody even has a checkbook. So every, every possibility is open. And in doing this, keeping a computer running took a certain amount of work, and you fax stuff back and forth. There were fax machines. 
So I had this idea that I was calling digital mailman, that you could type something on your computer. Instead of printing it out, we'd send it through the internet to a guy's mailbox at the other end, and then he could get it, and then he could type something back. And I really thought this digital mailman was a good idea, but it wasn't my best idea, so I put it on the back burner. Of course, we all use email. It seemed to be that that was probably the better idea. Um, the one that I came up with was, let's edit video on a computer and not have to go to a whole edit suite. You know, but all these new fields, wearables, the Internet of Things, you know, they're all open for anybody to be in charge. And, and I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I didn't set out to change the world. I didn't set out you know, to work with all these famous people and create billion dollar companies. I got out of college and I bought into that social contract. Guys, I got good grades. I literally on my first resume had my, my GPA, right? I'm like, look, I'm smart. And I got it out on recession. No one's going to hire me. And it didn't dawn on me. That's how dumb I was. Wait a second. No one's, I'm not competing against the same kids from school now. I'm competing against people with five, 10, 15 years experience in any field. Why would anybody hire a liberal arts major with zero experience? And I became a father early and I had young kids. So back against the wall, got to feed mouths. I took $1. I didn't have much. And I printed up business cards. And I made up a fake company. It's called Jasmine, J. Allen Samet, and it's mine. And I wanted to compete with Star Wars, with Industrial Light and Magic and Lucas, be the poor man Star Wars. We'll do special effects because everybody now needs special effects. That's a new field. I knew a little bit about computers. Let's do special effects. I didn't know how to do special effects and I hadn't done any special effects. But if I worked at this company that did special effects, maybe somebody would hire the company. They'd hire us. So I went out and hustled. And suddenly you have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of business. You go, oh, my God, this is a lot better than making $5 an hour. And then you go, holy crap, I guess I now have to hire people to know how to do this. And I found in life, you know, running all these companies, all these, it's always very easy to hire people with skills because most people just want a job. They want that, that, that belief of that steady paycheck. They're not willing to take that risk. And so we instantly worked in on one of the Star Trek movies and V and, and, and Superman and all these amazing, I'm like, oh my God, I'm working on these giant projects. I don't have a clue. Disrupt you really, and you know this, and I love your other video, it's linked below, um, really walks you through step by step. So this isn't theory. This isn't a journal saying, here's how the industry works. This isn't somebody that, you know, Jack Welch saying, well, if you served in World War II and did what I did, you could be the head of GE. It's not, you know, it's really anyone can. I'm not special. The bunch of all my friends that became billionaires are not special. They weren't the brightest, but they were the ones that weren't overcome by the blinders that are self-imposed. Yeah. You know? And we don't even have a choice either. It's like, you know, you can or you can't, but if you don't, I mean, job security is dead. Everything's changing like so fast and even faster and faster. You know, you're, you're, you're when screwed. I do this as, as a talk, I give you the, the chart that shows the, the destruction of the middle class. Mm. So a lot of capital at the top, um, widening of, 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 of the working poor and the non-working poor. Um, of households of people 30 years old or younger in the U.S., 50% do not have a bank account. So the other issue is everybody feels like the world is still the way that we see in the movies and television and, and, the, and the icons, you know, the leave it to beaver for my generation or the Brady Bunch or, you know, uh, the Simpsons, you know, anything that they think it's, it's that normal. And then they think it's them. Why am I the only one who can't get a job? Why am I the only one that's not failing? Why am I the only one that's not famous? Why am I the only one that's not? Look how easy it is to be a Kardashian. Um, you know, one of the myths, and I ran record companies that was – part of the mystique of the music business was you never wanted people to realize the machine of people that it takes to make that one guy on a stage look like he's just a guitarist and it's just him and he's in a garage and you know there there's 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 a stylist bringing from the dry cleaner this dirty ratty t-shirt right before he goes on i mean you know the whole image creation because it makes it seem like oh see he's just doing it all by himself see how easy it is um but in reality it's no different than stay at the end of Star Wars and see how many people it took to make that movie. It's there's a lot of, you know, people making all these things happen. But the difference is 
you can now virtually hire the people that you need. You don't need full-time staff. You don't need full-time office. It is 95% cheaper to launch a business today than it was at two, the year 2000. Hmm. The infrastructure's there. Six billion consumers, one click away. If I'm right for a nanosecond, I can become a billionaire. And when you look at, at people that just had new ideas but not fully done anything, um, Oculus Rift or Instagram, or you know, YouTube. These are all things where people became billionaires before they made a penny. You know, there are tons of millionaires in Silicon Valley that never made a profit. So that old model of I'm going to buy it for a nickel, sell it for a dime, and got to figure out not necessarily way. There are other people that once you prove the idea, let them scale it. Okay, mm. you know, people laugh that Zuckerberg paid too much for Instagram. Really? He's now making a fortune monetizing it. So what's the difference between you, the listener, you, Julian, or me, and the self-made billionaire? They have the same 24 hours in a day that you do, okay? They have access to the same audience and technology that you do, and they just decided to pursue something, you know? And so what was bizarre in finally writing the book and talking about is how many people I worked with over the years that... I couldn't tell you that these people were going to become billionaires or that I'd have 40 friends that became billionaires. That's insane. My dad was a public school teacher in Philadelphia, right? I lived in a row house. You owned the front wall and the back wall. You shared your side walls, right? I didn't know what wealthy was. I, I didn't understand what the world was. And yet many of these people didn't set out to become wealthy. They just had an idea. None of us saw these companies growing into what they were. None. If anybody told you they, they saw the internet was what it is today, they're completely full of it. Because the other side of it is I can tell you in every one of the famous companies you know, that there was a board meeting where should we cut the funding? Should we shut this down? It isn't working before they pivoted to, oh, my God, look how smart we are. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and I hate it when people go, oh, I had that idea three years ago. Really? And what did you do about it? Right? You know, uh, ideas don't make you rich, right? Hmm. People have dreams. Put a deadline on that dream. Then it becomes a goal. Then work towards backwards from that goal. Go through that process. The worst thing that will happen is you'll see yourself in a different light that will give you a little more strength, a little more opportunity, because the purpose in life is to live a life of purpose. You won't live forever, but what you create can what you can influence can. So whatever that may be, even if you're not money motivated, there's some big problems. Access to clean water, global warming, you know, name it, okay? Just address it. I, I, I talk about teenagers that came up with cures for different cancers. Why they're teenagers? I mean, it is humbling because just as you can spend all day watching TV or cat videos, you can also get three clicks away to every piece of research on any topic. People will share knowledge with you. There are patents that people will let you have for free to monetize. NASA has all sight of them. Take these, make money. So put away your excuses. Use your New Year's resolution for a new year, okay? The best time to launch your business was a year ago. The second best time is now. So thank you, Julian. Perfect. Yeah, thanks again for doing this. Put a link to your website here below. And as always, until next time.